Really, every every time I volunteer, there there are moments, um, and one that stays with me um, is when I was a student, actually, and and I was working on I think it was the third floor where the the clients are a lot sicker, and um, possibly on their way to to dying, and there was a woman there, and in massage there are always very personal moments. The whole thing is always very personal, but I remember. The woman was barely conscious and barely aware, and my task as a student was to to go in and ask her what type of massage she would like, and and she just laid there and just said, "Do you know? Do do whatever you think." And so I just went in and I was massaging her hands, massaging her legs, and she was barely barely awake, barely conscious. And I just remember she just looked up at me, and it's just a feeling, really. She just looked up, and she just said, thank you. And then I looked over, and I saw on her um, dresser were cards from her little daughter. She, has, she had two little daughters that, you know, said, Mommy, we care about you. We love you. You know, we want you to get better. And it was just a place I'll hold in my heart, you know, that... It just showed that this woman, who was maybe on her way dying, could still experience a loving and wonderful exchange before she, before she went. When I started to approach my first door, it was, it was, it was, it was actually terrifying for me because before I could knock on that door, I really realized I'm walking into this person's home. This just is not a room. This is their home. And I have no idea who's going to be on the other side of that door. And I was really, really, really kind of frozen. And I couldn't knock on that door because I was really afraid. It's like, what am I going to see? What am I going to smell? Is there going to be all these tubes and will that person be dying? What are they going to look like? And so then I remember I walked back and there's a meditation room in Bailey and I went there and I sat and I really thought about it. It's like, okay, how are you going to make peace with this? How are you going to be able to do this? So what I did was I I kind of had to clear myself and take myself into my own life and think about what if this were one of my children? What if this was my husband? What if that was my mother or my sister or my brother? Which actually all these people are. There's somebody's mother, there's somebody's brother, or whatever. Well, if it were my son or my daughter or my mom or dad, it was like there's nothing in hell that would keep me from walking in that door no matter what they looked like or what it smelled like or how scary it was. It was like I would just walk through that door and be with them. And so then I started a little ritual that before I would walk in somebody's door, I would go through a mantra of saying, this is my father, this is my mother, this is my son, this is my daughter. And then I knocked on the door and walked in. Taking off from what I was just talking about, I can remember going into somebody's room once and they were involved in leading a band for many years. It was a very, very successful band. And this was the lead singer of the band. And he didn't want me to bring the dog in the room, uh, so I turned around and started walking away. And then I saw a cuckoo clock on his wall. I'm trying to remember the, the uh, and anyway, I, I collect cuckoo clocks. I'm trying to remember what I said to him, but something that brought a connection between him and I with cuckoo clocks. And then he said, well, come in the room for a minute. So I, I brought Denali in the room, and after you know, less than 60 seconds, 
he just warmed right up to the dog and it took his mind right off of things I could tell because he was a very, he was thinking very seriously about something when I walked in. Now his mind was on something completely different and he started uh, talking about, you know, what his life was like a few years before that. And I asked him about his band and he said, well, do you want to hear it? And I thought he was just going to put in a CD. Well, he did. He put in a CD to play some music, and it was unbelievable music. And then he started singing with the music, and I couldn't tell whether the voice was coming out of his mouth or out of the CD player. It was that close, and he was an unbelievable singer. You know, singing loudly in this room, he has a terminal illness, and I thought, you know, if you can go in a room and make people like this sing, then there's something good coming out of this. And that's another thing that just always keeps me coming back when you see things like that. That was, that was an experience I'll never forget. I had um, walked into the lobby and encountered a client that I had given a ride to many times before. And on this particular day, she was all decked out. She had on a long fur and this unusually large wig, and she looked good. And uh, she uh, needed a ride, so we got settled in the car. And uh, she, uh, we got the fur tucked in and got the, the wig was kind of pressing against the liner of the car. And we got the door closed. And as we were driving out of the parking lot, she breaks down into tears. And I thought, you know, at, at first that the, her hair must be caught in the door. And she turns to me at that moment and says, I would not have made it home today if it wasn't for you. And it was one of those times where I thought, again, for something as simple as a ride, um, it makes a world of difference to somebody. So it was, a, it was kind of an interesting moment. This person that had left, this friend had, that had left, had been readmitted, and um, I saw him in his room and he was just on the verge of death, you know. He was in the very last stages. He couldn't speak or anything. Um, that's one of the signs the voice will go. And so um, I came in and I spoke a little with him and told him I was glad to see him and he just passed on right there. And it was very, um, I'd never been that close. That was the first time that anyone had passed um, with my hand on them. And to me, it felt like the air just got golden and light, you know, but that was my perception. But um, there was music playing when I came in. The radio was on. And as soon as he died, two songs that he used to play over and over again to me when he was ill the first time when I first met him, all of a sudden came on the radio. And that was just so weird. <laughs> but um, it was just kind of a, you know, confirmation for me, you know, there, there's more to this than um, me just dying. And anyways, that, I mean, um, I was just, an, I just, and I just was filled with, you know, I felt like I was full of grace <laughs> at that point, so. That's my story. <laughs> Each week when I come, I, I, uh, uh, when I arrive at Bailey, I go from room to room. I check in with patients or residents that I know, um, and also with residents that are new since the last time I was there. And this one fellow was new to Bailey. I walked in and uh, explained who I am and that I do Reiki and that I'm a volunteer and asked if he was interested in, in having a treatment. And this, this young man was very ill. Um, the, the, the staff does not share with the volunteers the specific aspects of the, the, the resident's medical situation, but you didn't, have to, uh, you, didn't, you didn't have to be a trained professional to realize that this person was nearing the end of his life. And, um, and he said that he would, he nodded that he would like to have Reiki, and so I uh, spent the next 30 minutes actually uh, just sharing healing touch with him. And I noticed that his, his body just really, he'd been very tense, and his body just relaxed under my hands. And 
uh, he started breathing more, uh, more comfortably. His breathing had been a little um, rushed. And, uh, and when we finished, I asked if, uh, if he'd be interested in, in me coming back again next week. And oh, he was very ill. He, he nodded yes, that he would. And when I came back the next week, um, there were two of his relatives actually standing outside the door to his room. And obviously in a, a very intimate moment, um, silent, standing very close to one another. And I walked up and I asked, how is this person doing today? We can call him Brian. How is Brian doing today? And they said, he, he just passed. And they took a breath and said, he just passed. And I said, oh, I was sorry. And that uh, I explained that I'm a volunteer and that I do Reiki. And they, they immediately started talking about how much they uh, appreciated and were grateful for the staff at Bailey Boucher and how well people had cared for their relative. And I didn't know whether he was a son or, or uh, what relation. Um, and, and they asked me if I would like to see him. And um, I, I turned, I said yes. And I, I turned and headed into the room and I a turned and asked, would it be okay if I offer him Reiki now? And they smiled and said, of, of course. And, uh, and so I went into his room and I spent about five minutes with him. And that alone was a really powerful experience, just be with this person at this, this point in their transition in life, um, out of life. But then when I walked back out of the room, the look on, the look of kind, um, gratitude from this young man's family members were just priceless and um, and I, I see their faces all the time I see that young man's face I see their faces and the, the the appreciation for the work that we all do together is priceless very rewarding One particular holiday season, um, I was cutting paper snowflakes with a resident and he was having trouble with his scissors and we were kind of working together to make these snowflakes and I cut one and when I opened it up, it actually, to him, looked like an angel and he wanted one for him just like it. He wanted two of them, one for him and one for me. And then, you know, when you fold those papers and you cut those snowflakes, making a second one like the first one is really difficult. And so I took another piece of paper and kind of folded it with the first one, held the first one up as a pattern, and it probably took a half an hour to get all the little details, but we had two of them. And his name went on one, and my name went on the other and we hung them in the dining room and after Christmas he passed and um, again that was another one that really touched me and he had saved those angel snowflakes and had asked one of the nurses should something happen to him would she please give me our snowflakes and I still have them